Hola, hola. Hola, hola. If I'm here, then it's fine. So I'm safe here. So as you go here, <laughs> okay, so thank you for being here uh, today. We have uh, here to uh, give us a talk, Evinaida. Uh, he's professor at Digital Humanities at University of Cologne in Germany. Uh, he uh, worked uh, as a programmer and project manager in several projects in IT and cultural heritage application mainly and also had uh, positions at the University of Oslo and University of Passau. <laughs> and then he is uh, uh, the current chair of the uh, Euro European uh, Association of uh, Digital Humanities. And also he's engaged in other international associations related with um, information systems, software engineering and cultural heritage, okay? So, uh <laughs> I don't know, he's uh, today here to present uh, the talk Exploring Models Through Programming. So thank you for being here, Avin. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for the invitation and the hospitality. And um, I will talk about theory and practice. Does it work? You need to turn on the... Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. turn on this. Yeah, so you don't... Yeah. 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 Uh, no problem. You have a sound just, just press the... Yeah. And it's okay. working now. Okay, good. So, uh, yes, so I said thank you for a lot of things. And um, so I'm going to talk about theory and practice. Um, I will come back to this, but to me, programming and computer science is not the same, obviously. Uh, they are connected, but they're not the same. And programming is a practical skill. So, I will start with an example. I will talk about how the interactivity and the understanding of data is different depending on what relationship you have to the data. So I will use a very specific and concrete example uh, based on some development I did as part of my PhD. And it's about textual representation. Um, you can see text as a linear thing as you see it in streams or uh, string uh, variables. You can see text as hierarchical, the chip traditional SGML, XML view that you see in things like text coding initiative. And you can have a gra graph-based understanding of text. Uh, if you, for instance, look at uh, anal analysis of manuscripts with different corrections and different reading, patterns, then you see the graph structure where you can establish different readings. In th this case, of course, and often the graphs are directed. 
And uh, examples on how we implement this linear can be in plain text, hierarchical XML encoding, and graph based could, for instance, be in RDF. Uh, and then, of course, this is how they are modeled at one level. And then again, we can linearize the RDF as XML, of course, but that's a different thing. So, this is a concrete example from the Ox Oxygen XML editor. And for those who work with XML, this is a fairly standard view. You see the tree here uh, with the encapsulation between various elements. And uh, you see a textual view here where in this kind of author view, each element is shown by specific symbols. So you can go in, you can also show it with the tags, of course. So a standard view of seeing the linear structure of a text. You can read it one word after the other and the hierarchical structure expre expressed by indentation and, and some, some symbols. So very standard. Uh, but um, as uh, those who worked with XML obviously know, XML is a tree-based structure when it comes to validation. But of course, you can express graphs in XML by using XML ID, IDRF connections. So you can connect any two elements in an XML document by links. And if you see these links as part of the, uh, of the organization, of the knowledge model, information model, then of course uh, the XML document is a graph. And I'll show you a graphical example of that later. So here, for instance, you have a link between two things, two elements. And uh, this is how these links are presented in an oxygen. And of course, you can see that there are links here. But the level of intuitiveness, if you can say that in English, is a little bit lower than for the tree and the, and the linear structure. You really have to twist your brain a bit to actually understand the structure of these links by just seeing the endpoints of them. So how currently tools are manipulated in digital humanities, the tools that people use which mostly, with some exceptions, come straight out of industry, are good for working on texts, seen as sequences and trees. And they are a lot of nice tools for visualizing graphs. But there are no integration between text editing tools and graph manipulation tools. So you cannot manipulate the graph structure of a textual document <coughs> easily. Um, you can use the links, uh, but they are hard, <coughs> especially for people who are not used to work in these kinds of structures to actually understand and work with. So the specific tool I'm talking about is a tool that did something called critical stepwise formalization from a text via some more and more formal structure to geographical data and a map. And the idea was not to run the process because that can be done much easier. In other ways, the point was to understand what is happening during the process and media differences and so on. So it was a tool. It was uh, small data sets. So nothing like uh, statistical analysis or big data or anything like that, surely. Uh, it was a computer it was a computer program I wrote for this, but uh, the main goal is to do humanities research on specific data. So it was this implementation of my methodology, so to speak, and it so it implements one specific type of modeling that I needed to, to run through. It was the developed by one developer, it had one user, it worked on one data set, it actually worked on one screen size. And as many of you know, making a research tool uh, is one thing, something that works for you or maybe a small group for research. Making this something that can even be shared as a meaningful open source uh, project uh, adds at least 100% uh, more development time. It's, it's a fundamental difference. And uh, making things like that is fairly cheap compared to even making a fairly okay project for a more general user group. So the focus here is this specific relationship with, be, between text and something moving in the direction of gra a graph structure. 
So this is how the tool looks. It's surely no better than uh, oxygen. That's not the point. And the idea was that well, you had some base data, you had some marked up place names, uh, you could do a little bit of automatic stuff, but you needed to uh, establish quickly links between places because you wanted to see how places related to each other as expressed by the text. And that had to be done manually because it's a fairly complex uh, human reading of 18th century Danish texts. So for a number of reasons, this could not at least at that time be automatized in any meaningful way. So this is just a tool to quickly make links. And uh, so I used a keyboard instead of a mouse and so on to speed up the stuff. Um, and, um, and what you see, of course, is that this is a typical simplified TEI structure, you have a division, you have some paragraphs, and within the paragraphs you have some place names, you have a nice tree structure up here. But then because these two place names refer to the same real life place, you have a co-reference between these two, you have a co-reference between these two, and if you put the co-reference here, then you are breaking the, the tree structure, and you have a graph. Uh, but then of course the co-references in XML will be expressed by XML ID relationships with some sort of syntactic sugar on it. So how it looks in, in the app when you do this co-reference stuff is just a list of place names and the place name from the digitized um, list uh, of place name kind of a kind of an uh, index uh, from a printed version in a, from the 20th century. And then you can go in and see the context of each use of the place names and so on. So it connects place references in the text to place references in the register, uh, in the index. And uh, they are connected because they refer to the same place. And of course, as you know, the fact that they happen to have the same spelling doesn't mean it's the same place. And the fact that they have different spellings, especially in the 18th century uh, documents, the fact that they have different spellings could still be the same place. So there are links established here and they can be visualized and they can be manipulated in this tool. But this is exactly the same situation as we saw in Oxygen. The graph is here, but you can't really see it, can you? I mean, so the prob what puzzled me when I was working on this and especially reflecting on it afterwards, why do I see the graph in this stuff? Because the links are still just ID values. It's still the same as using Oxygen. But in this case, I actually saw the graph. I had a feeling for the data structure and how things were organized. So why did I experience the graph as something I knew what was? And of course, the, pack, the point is that the graph is here. Uh, just uh, a random part of the, of the source code in Java shown from Eclipse. The reason why I saw the graph was that I was writing the program. So I was actively engaging with the data structures. I was writing the, ha the, the, the functions and the classes operating on the data structure. And that creates a feel for the data structure, which is different from what you have unless you do that. So if you are doing encoding, if you're working in Oxygen or any other tool and adding tags and creating, creating XML documents basically, you create a tree model of the text. Often you just use something already existing the humanities, cultural heritage is often TEI, it could be something else. Then you formalize that model in TEI XML. Today people, and also previously people could formalize it in something else, but this is XML. And then you reify this into an editing tool and you make in a way a working environment so that you can, can create the document you want to create. That's fine, you understand the text. You read, if it's manuscripts, you read the handwriting. You sort out a number of fairly complex problems. Could be uh, dead languages, uh, complex writing, these kinds of things. On the other hand, if you're working with these things as a programmer, depending on what kind of tool you use, of course Java has a DOM document object model uh, implementation you can use as a standard thing. It's not good. At least it didn't used to be very good, but it works. And if you create a little local library with some additions, it's actually okay. Uh, and of course, any node 
you declare as an object DOM object will be a node in the tree. This is how it works. It will have parents, siblings, children, all these kind of tree things that, that you need to have. And as a DOM object, this node is locked into this structure. You cannot add a second parent because the DOM structure is a tree structure. It's not a structure for multiple inheritance. Uh, and there are a number of other things you cannot do because they are illegal, because it's a tree structure. However, this DOM object is also just an object. So what you can do with it is you can encapsulate it in another object. And that other object, you can link to whatever you want. So that means that you can create something which is, for all practical reasons, your same DOM object. And that can be linked to any other kind of structure, graph structure or whatever, in the software you're writing. So in this sense, you can implement quite um, straightforward this triple nature we, we mentioned. Graph object, DOM object, and the text. And of course, this is the tree. No, this is the graph, this is the tree, and this is the linearity of the text. So that means that we get something like this. Uh, you have a Java object which represents an XML node, but it is not the DOM object. It's encapsulating it so that it contains the tree node nature because it has the, the DOM object that you already have all these things for free because it's a standard library. You have the textual nature. You can extract the text from any object using the DOM structure because text linearization based on XML is a straightforward process because you have, you have the tree structure and you have the direction. But you can also treat it as a graph node because of the encapsulating object. So that means that you have an object in the DOM hierarchy, which includes a text, and it's a node in the tree, but it's also encapsulated in this graph object, and the DOM object is, of course, the same, which means that if we do changes seeing this from the graph, then as long as they're legal within the DOM structure, they will also be reflected there, and the, what we have is something similar to function calls using call, call, uh, call by address. Uh, you are operating on the common object from different sides. So we have a visualization problem. So if this works, and it's not just inside my head, and I heard that at least some other people have heads that operate in somehow the same way, by being a programmer, we can see the structure. But the problem is, how can we make these things available to tool users? And what is fairly clear here is that the reason why I see something is because I can manipulate it. And I'll come back to that point in a second. I see what happens when I change things. And I understand the structure that way. So the question is how we can operationalize object manipulation in a way make it uh, available for tool users or to the degree we cannot how far do we have to go to accept that people doing serious work in the humanities or in cultural heritage also need to be programmers this question was raised the first time in the late 1960s do the historian need to be a programmer and uh, it's not going away soon this is a fundamental question and uh, I have a personal biographical answer. Uh, and we have an answer in Cologne implemented in our study programs. Uh, but it's none of them are the answer. Other people do it differently for very good reasons. And to be clear about this, I will probably mention it again. But just to make it perfectly clear, I am talking about research development here. I'm talking about the kind of development where you're making a little tool for a person or a group to investigate something. I am not talking about the museum system for 140 museums and 260 million objects. That is a fundamentally different thing. And I want a group of with diverse computer science, theoretical and practical backgrounds to implement something like that using serious methodology. 
with of course cultural heritage people but that is a totally i mean making large systems making infrastructure i've been involved in that too it's a totally different ball game so i'm talking about small applications for for research and whether it's actually possible and to which degree it's possible for tool users to see through manipulation in the way programmers can so let's um summarize a little bit before we go into a little bit more <laughs> theoretical uh, view on this. Programmers, we can see things through manipulation. This is similar to what Piaget, psychologists, uh, use heavily in all sorts of pedagogical thinking. The child makes the world real by interacting with it. So it's not just about understanding in an abstract sense. It's, it's about embodied uh, realness. We cannot be in the world in, unless we're able to interact with it. And there's a lot of uh, psychological uh, experiments, both on, on animals and humans, showing this very clearly. So um, as tool users, we also have response and feedback mechanisms. And the question is, how far can we get? So to me, this is connected to how we see modeling. Because modeling, as it is applied in the sciences, uh, especially natural sciences, social sciences, also in the humanities, uh, is a way of interacting with something in order to understand it better. So we're talking about a slightly different, I'll come back to that distinction. It's not a thick, clear distinction, but it's a slightly different basic understanding of modeling from what we usually see in computer science and techno sciences in general, and especially in mathematics, where it's very precise and specific. So for instance, this is a model. Um, so why, how do we know it's a model? Well, it, it's a photography of a model, uh, which is projected as light on a wall. Um, but how do I see that it's a model or a picture of a model? Or maybe the picture is a model too. How do I see that it's a picture of a model? Um, because I have some intuition what this thing might be. And arenas used to be built that way quite a few years ago, like 2000 or so. And uh, it's too perfect. So no arena in the world is kept from antiquity in this form. I've seen a few of them. And I assume that none of them are. So that means that is, this is a model in some sense. It could be a modern reconstruction. Or it could be, well, it's a modern reconstruction. Uh, in some sort of media, in some sort of physicality. Uh, as far as I know, no full-scale models this quality do exist, so I assume it's also a size-reduced model. Um, I um, could think uh, it is a physical replica, but I don't. Not just because I don't think so, also because I know it it's, uh, has a different materiality, it has a computer-carried materiality. So it's a 3D model, right? And uh, those of you who can, can read this stuff can immediately see that this is fake. It's not that thing at all. Uh, it's just showing uh, generally people in the humanities that there's a mathematics behind this, of course. So if you take a, a 3D computer-based artifact, it's based on a geometrical expression. Uh, and then you have the 3D visual artifact we see. And that artifact is not just a visualization of mathematics or geometry. It is a model. So this thing up here is a model. We create it, we manipulate it, and we learn from it. And we do all these things often without even, without reflecting on the geometry. Often even without knowing there is mathematics behind this, or at least needing to know. Of course, if you're able to operate at this level, that might give you some additional benefit because you can do some quick and dirty, quick ch changes here to manipulate this thing. But you don't need it. You can operate solely on this. And this is what people often do in tools like 3ds Max or whatever you use for, for 3D modeling. So it is a model. This thing is also a model. We're currently working on the relationship. I think it doesn't really matter whether you call them two different related models or two different versions of the same model. It's, that's, I think, a question of language. But the point is, again, knowing this thing is something we can do through manipulation. And knowing this thing gives us a different 
understanding. The materiality of the model as we meet it give us different understandings on what we can do with it and what it means. So modeling in this context is a uh, creative process of thinking and we create external representations. So the point is, of course, you can talk about mind models and so on. There's a lot of psychology and neuroscience on, on that. That's not our competence and not what we're talking about. We're talking about creating external representations. Some of them are carried by computers. Some of them are made from cardboard. Some of them are on whiteboards or in all sorts of other media. This is from a Montessori school. As a research strategy, because this is actually can be seen more generally, then it's researchers making and manipulating these external representations, imaginary concreta. And the point is that you have conceptual objects, you have conceptual understandings of the world, and you want to make sense of them. And making sense of things often means we have to express them. I don't know what I think before I said it. And you have to communicate. I understand what I say when I see this expression on your face, right? Oh, so bad. Uh, so, um, so the point is, in order to communicate about these things, we have to express them externally. And using all sorts of models and modeling strategies is a very efficient way of doing this in all sorts of science and research. Uh, so this is the well-beloved uh, double helix in the materiality of light. So um, just to run through some of, some of these things, you have the Bohr model of the atom. Again, the double helix. Um, don't know how many of you know about this. It's, it's basically a, a model showing how prey and um, predator populations vary over time in a fairly unbiased uh, environment. Of course, there's no clean environment in, in nature, but if you basically have two species and one is eating the other, you see that they have a certain development over time. And this is actually has a significant political impact because it shows that in many cases, uh, for fish, for instance, overfishing is not necessarily the reason why you have a collapse in fish stocks. Because if you no humans are there to fish, you will still have the collapses. It doesn't mean that the humans are not responsible of collapses in fish stocks. It just means that they don't, don't have to be. That uh, the fact that there is a collapse doesn't mean it's any relationship to fishing at all. So these models have a significant political impact. Uh, not to talk about this one, which basically has been used in various number of different implementations, used to argue for a number of different political systems and uh, used as uh, seemingly objective arguments for why we have to do what we do. Uh, Tana, uh, Tina. There is no alternative because our models show us reality, right? Actor network models in, in social science, economic models in general. Climate models, of course, extremely important politically. And uh, also, together with the economic models, uh, highly problematic models in the sense that they're predicting the future. And uh, that means they are based on certain factors, certain types of stability, and so on. Uh, the problem with climate models is that the concept climate skeptic or climate model skeptic, which should be the standpoint of any scientist, has been hijacked by somebody else. So saying that you're skeptical to climate models means something totally different from ordinary scientific skepticism. But being skeptic to, to models predicting the future is necessary. Uh, so these models are today fundamental to science. They haven't always been or haven't always been seen as, but they are now fundamental to science and they have a significant impact on so at society level. Still, philosophy of science is struggling and struggling and struggling to define these things and they're still working on, on it and won't finish this year. What we know that these models are not just static. You need to have some sort of interactivity in order to really understand them when you see these models expressed in print or in static digital media, you often see that they are totally not, it's imp not impossible to understand them, but it can be pretty hard. Uh, for instance, uh, the well-known hairball from network analysis. This hairball is clearly showing that you have a strong, no, 
it's showing you because you have been playing with this for three months. A picture of it doesn't show anything. Sorry. So um, they have very forms that can be physical, and of course, different kinds of physicality, materiality. In the philosophy of science, there's a lot of talk about fictional objects, uh, whether scientific models, for instance, models in physics are fictional or not. Uh, and again, I think this is mostly a question of how you want to phrase things and what kind of words you use, because in certain understandings of fictionality, of course, they're, fic they're fictional, because they are simplifications of reality. They are not expressing directly reality. Partly because, of course, physicists as other people don't know reality. Uh, and then, of course, there are other things can be expressed in set theory, mathematics, and a lot of other, other forms. So, let's take, go back to some examples. This is um, a map of London, created by Dr. John Snow in 1854. It was a cholera outbreak. People were dying, a lot of people were dying. And uh, what he had were lists of deaths with addresses. So he, they had identified each person dying and which house they lived in. And uh, what he did, I don't know exactly his motivation, uh, but what he did was just to make small, thin strokes on a map for each death. So uh, you see here a clear correlation. There, are, there is an over-represented area very strongly. And uh, there is one factor combining this area. They used water from the same well. They closed the well, and the cholera outbreak stopped. What is interesting here is that uh, this is, uh, with good reason, <coughs> much feared example of correlation only. There was no causality understanding, as far as I understand it, because bacteria was, at the time, seen as uh, a myth. The bacteria model of, uh, of disease spread was seen as unscientific. Nobody has ever seen a bacteria, and they had other models they were operating by. So at this time, they had no clue why this well was killing people. They just saw that closing it saved lives. So this is how a model, in this case, a paper map graphical model, can show you enough correlation to make you act in reality and change it. This is another uh, very important model, this time from the humanities. Uh, Morphology of the Folk Tale by Vladimir Propp. This is uh, an English edition. It's originally from the 1920s, uh, published in, 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 uh, in Russian. And it's basically a series of uh, positions or states uh, a specific type of folk tale will go through. And it's based on the study of a few hundred folk tales. It's, it's all manual, of course, done in the 19, 1910s, 1920s mostly. Um, so it's, uh, it's basically a model which, in a way, expresses a hypothesis that there is a structure of all folk tales, at least some classes of folk tales. Uh, a fun fact I had a student from Bangladesh in Kassel, and she tried to run this on a popular book about the establishment of the state of Bangladesh. So a history text officially certified by the government. And uh, there were some things missing, but it actually worked fairly well. And I think running this on, the, uh, on similar documents uh, from the especially the 19th century in Europe, in some parts of Europe also in the 20th century, with these creation myths for, for nations, uh, it actually makes a lot of sense. Because they are often organized as fairy tales. Um, this is a fairly more complex thing uh, visually. It's uh, a narratological model. So it's showing what happens between the real author, which is not existing, because this is after Roland Barthes killed the author. Don't know what I'm talking about, just forget it. Uh, the author is not relevant, and the audience is not relevant. Uh, but they have to be irrelevant uh, anyway, so you call the implied audience an implied author. So it's the, the, the aspect in the text that has an author-like function something like that. And then there's a lot of things, and you have all sorts of uh, event plots and actions and stuff. Uh, this is the only graphical uh, 
thing, the only graphical image in a book of 270, 280 pages or something. So this is in a way summarizing almost 300 pages of narrative text. So the model is of course established in the text, but this is a visual representation of it. And it's from, from the late 1970s. Uh, sometimes I ask negatively, sometimes I ask positively. Let's be positive. How many have seen this before? Yeah, a few. So this is uh, somewhere in Lithuania. This is Moscow. So it's an ordinary scaled map. And uh, this is 420,000 soldiers. And this is 20,000 soldiers or so. And it's the size of Napoleon's army uh, during and after the attack and occupation of Moscow during the Napoleon War. So, of course, it shows very clearly uh, Stalin's uh, claim. Uh, one death is a tragedy, 10,000 is statistic. It's showing the statistical nature of, of war. Uh, in addition to that, uh, showing space, of course, it shows time and it shows numbers of soldiers. So it has that level of quantification. Down here, you have actually the temperature on the way back, which starts uh, at, uh, as a summer temperature of zero, going down to Chile minus 21, up to quite nice minus 11. I'm from Norway. And uh, then uh, it actually gets cold with minus 30 over here. And uh, this is actually not Celsius, but it's the, the scale used here is fairly close to Celsius. So. So it's generally seen as one of the most efficient historical graphical models ever made, at least in the, in the, in the 19th century. Um, I have also showed it in Russia, so I'm very careful also to ask what it's not showing. And of course, it's not showing Russian soldiers. It's not showing civilians. It's not showing animals. So for instance, adding uh, a poem or a painting will in a way clarify how this model is representing something and a romantic painting uh, by a Russian painter depicting an event from this war will show something quite different. Uh, and of course, it's no critique that it's excluding things. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. That's why it's efficient. So if we see how we use these things in digital humanities, one of the uses of modeling is, of course, to make things. And this is fairly close to what is often done in computer science. Uh, you create a model so that you can create an implementation. But we also do it to understand things. And I'm not saying that these are disconnected. The point is, this is the purpose. When we make something, of course, we have to understand it and understand what we are replicating and everything. But sometimes the purpose is understanding. And the purpose can also be teaching. It's often about what making what is implicit explicit, which is always a partly process, because we cannot make everything implicit explicit. Uh, as Hearst said, uh, context is a spurious concept. So you cannot really know everything which is implicit, but taking some of the implicit stuff and making it explicit, for instance, this is a person name, is highly useful. In the humanities, we are usually modeling things that has already been created by humans and often as media products, media expressions. This is different from especially natural sciences where what is modeled is natural processes. Uh, so that has a number of consequences uh, because the, the, the things we are modeling, for instance, the texts or paintings and so on, their real nature can only be expressed through the human mind because they have no self-identity in the way that gravity has, maybe. This is a philosophical question. The point is, in order to make a poem into something different from black marks on a white page, you have to use the human mind. That's the only thing I know of that can actually make the poem a poem by understanding what the graphical mark represents in a human language. And humans often struggle with this, too, of course. Um, there are some other things we work on, and of course, for instance, in archaeology, it's not just about human products. There's a number of other things connected to that, which is part of what we're working on. Models are always mediated, because we're not talking about mind models. You can say that the mind is doing mediation too, but then I don't know. They are dynamic, 
Sometimes the models we create are dynamic and today quite commonly. So we can f change them, we can deform them, we can turn them around, we can manipulate them. But when you create a model, it's always dynamic. When we create anything, it's always dynamic. That's creation. Uh, and it's always dynamic when we use it. So even a, a fixed um, model, as a Deminar or something, a graphical representation, when you start using it, it has a certain level type of dynamic behavior because we're interacting with parts and moving around over it anyway. So we're focusing on modeling, on the verb rather than the known. So again, an example, um, just to show that we can do really, really, really geeky examples here too. This is Roman portable sundials. It's a very specific class of object from late antiquity. So it was, a sun it was like a pocket watch, but a sundial. And of course, in order to use this when you were traveling, you needed to know where you were for obvious, obvious uh, reasons. So they tended to have lists of place names engraved in the back with coordinates, or at least ordinates often they were obvious. Anyway, uh, so this is uh, a listing of place names that is modeled on a modern map. Well, it's really an interpretation of a listing of these place names. Um, where they are put on the map is, of course, uh, a choice made scholarly, but still a choice made by the modeler. And uh, the order is following the order as they were engraved. That's a choice. And uh, the whole identification process, and also the idea of using a modern map, which is really anachronistic, is not bad. It's just a choice. You could have said, we want to represent how these people thought about these things. We don't think this is appropriate. And then somebody can argue, no, 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 no. After Ptolemy, this is totally appropriate. So it's not that there is right and wrong in a strict sense. It's just that you always have to make choices when you do these things. So there is always a complex relationship between a model and a target. And uh, in the humanities, but also in, in natural sciences, to some extent social sciences, it has been uh, fairly straightforward representational view that wasn't really discussed that much uh, for parts of the 19th century where you in a way saw these morphism relationships, isomorphism between a model and model target. Uh, but the last 15, 20 years, it's a real development towards seeing it uh, in a more pragmatic sense and specifically pragmatic meaning that somebody creates a model of something. These are the two things we always had, but somebody is creating it for some purpose. So somebody is creating the double helix for the purpose of what? Making it clearer how the DNA works, uh, showing exactly how the molecule structure is, just scale it up in size, or for any other number. Uh, the board cre board created his model of the atom for pedagogical reasons. Uh, to have something to play with when they were doing thought experiments. There can be a number of reasons, but the point is there's always a somebody and there's always a purpose. And models can always be made differently. So it's often said that models are mediating between the theory and the physical world. So it's a mediator between where you get your data from and the theories you try to use to understand that those data. Between is also questioned a bit because they're in a way autonomous. They're in a way also just floating around being a third thing. So this is currently being, people try to understand this better. Um, and um, traditionally also in, in digital humanities, we have borrowed our understanding from computer science, techno sciences, uh, but, and also strongly connected to data modeling. Uh, two of the main people working on modeling uh, are only working on data modeling. Um, but since there were a few mentions before, Knut Illa was very clear about the need in 2010. Klaleman and Lottmann expressed it very clearly in 2013, how semiotics can be used to understand scientific modeling. Uh, and so we know seeing, and that's the kind of stuff I'm involved in, seeing modeling as a process of signification. So, so it's, it's, it's a semiotic process. It's a, sem it's a process on signs or on, uh, you can call them signals as well. So 
how do, does, does this look in more, I don't know, half reality? You have the source of a model. For instance, the fact that somebody is taking photographs, you want to make a system for photographs or you want to understand photography better. So we abstract from a lot of photographer praxis into an, uh, and, uh, a model of photography to understand how you can make, make things or understand it better. Then you can use this as a model for, and you can mediate it out for, for instance, a, a web system uh, for digital library for pho photography. And uh, the model is a model of and model for, according to Mar, and also linking back to model of and model for as concepts Geertz, as far as I know, introduced in anthropology in, in 73. These things are always aspects of the model, but we focus differently. Sometimes the model of is the main focus, sometimes the model for. And, and the straight distinction between model of and model for is that the model of is a grammar. You have a dialect, somebody creates a grammar of that dialect. It's a model simplifying, excluding a lot of detail, but creating some structure of that specific dialect. No, it happens to be that dialect is the dominating dialect of a nation. So for instance, official French or high German or something. Then that dialect is how people are supposed to write and sometimes how they're supposed to talk as well. And then that grammar is spread to school children all over the country as a model for how they're supposed to write. So it's the same thing, but it's used in slightly different ways. And of course, this, this is in a way the concrete world and this is more abstract. Um, this kind of concreteness, abstractness has of course been there all the time. Those of you who remember 1975, database modeling with a conceptual, logical, and physical schema has been slightly influential also after that. Independent level, some sort of encapsulation. It's basically three perspectives and this is, at least for those of us who write code, the concrete level and this is a more abstract conceptual level, even said called conceptual scheme. You see the same in graph theory. Uh, of course, uh, this is the same graph. Uh, and this is the same graph. Uh, and then you have something you can call the abstract graph. And uh, it's a problem showing it because it's abstract, right? So we have a visualization problem representing these things. It's the same in formal semantics. How do you show the object? We can make a drawing of it, yeah, but then it's not an object, it's a drawing of the object. So the abstract graph is something which we cannot see because it's, it's really abstract. This is, to me at least, slightly more abstract than this. Maybe that's just personal way of seeing the world. But, but the point is these things are concrete and can be visualized and they're concrete visual forms of an abstract thing. It's the same in geometry and in GIS. Cartography, this is a point and this is a line. No, it's not. This is not a point and this is not a line. They are both polygons, right? Because they have uh, sides. But the problem is if you want to show a point, it's invisible and that makes it hard to operate on for humans. So therefore, we always show these things as small polygons. And then we have uh, an understanding, shared conceptualization uh, that a small polygon with specific forms is used to represent a point. Uh, you have the same in library science. You have something called Hamlet, but how do we know what is part of Hamlet? We have the text written by Shakespeare. Well, we don't have the text written by Shakespeare in the physical form, but we have a text based on what he wrote or dictated. Then we have a performance in uh, a totally different language. And then we have a film in a third language, and then we have a Japanese comics. And uh, then we have all these things. How do we know that these represent the same? There is nothing in the physical materiality or the physicality of these things connecting them. The only way to connect them is to create a conceptual object, a non-material object. And that's what Ferber do with work, um, functional requirement for bibliographic record. So we need these abstract objects in order to make our world fit together. I'll just saying that there's no hierarchy, that's not that important, right? No, I think. 
because the problem is, and this is a general problem in, in computer, all sorts of computer applications in cultural heritage and humanities, meaning can only be negotiated in the human mind. So what do I tell uh, my students uh, when I have to mention the forbidden world, knowledge management? or wisdom management, which is supposed to exist as well. Uh, I just tell them it's a different meaning of knowledge. Knowledge management is not the same meaning of knowledge as the meaning I'm talking about here. Meaning, as it's talked about here, is the traditional humanities meaning of meaning, or meaning of being able to engage with our artworks and communicate. It's based on understanding and desire. A desire to understand, a desire to get somewhere as humans. And without that desire and without that understanding, I cannot see knowledge in this sense or meaning in this sense to be negotiated by computers. Then knowledge management is a different meaning of the same word, which is fine. Because what we have to do, we have to sh make a link between conceptual objects and the objects we can see, the objects we can share. We need these for human-to-human -human communication, but also for a meaningful semantic web working in the humanities. And this has to be based on agreed upon meaning. Just take the CDOC CRM as an example. You have classes. You have birth as a class. And that's perfectly fine. And, and it's a subclass of beginning of existence. And it's expressed in first order logic. So that means that if you have a number of instances of birth events, and you have a number of instances of um, beginning of existence events, you know how they relate and you can do formal reasoning. And depending on your, the quality of your data, you can do more or less reasoning. And depending on the power of the model. And CDOC CRM is fairly uh, weak as, as a formal reasoning model, but you can do some sort of formal reasoning for improving your search results and information integration and so on. There are things you can do. But that doesn't tell you what a birth is. It doesn't tell you what beginning of existence is. It's just a relationship between things that are totally disconnected from anything else. We could call them E something uh, and just a number. Well, that's actually what we do. Uh, or we could call them Boeing. It doesn't matter. We can only use them for something meaningful if we connect it to the human life world. And the word birth is not enough. So we have a scope note, examples, and so on, trying to make this connection to the human life world. And that connection is always fuzzy. And it's always fussy in, in the sciences, in the humanities, everywhere, but they're fussy in different ways. The relationship between data, data models, and, um, and hypothesis testing in physics is highly complex. And it has a lot of involvement from human beings because there are always things happening in measuring equipment, or it tends to be, and also in measuring conditions and all this sort of thing. So we need the human to make the connection to reality but we also need the formal structures to do the work as formal structures because then we know if we have a certain starting point, we know where we go. So we have a fixed part of our system, but that fixed part is also always floating in the sea of the unknown. I mean, come on, we're all post popish, right? We know that there is no uh, kind of positivist objective reality we can relate to directly. So we need this combination between something which can give us formal reasoning and meaning to connect meaningful formal reasoning. So if you look at, again, a similar thing, you have a Viking ship excavated uh, in the ninth century, reconstructed in 1910, 1920. Well, the archeologists say constructed, even if the planks are mostly from the original. We'll come back to that. And then there is a created object, which is uh, in this case, a 3D model. And we can use this to generate knowledge, not just in these comparisons, but also in the processes of creating and using the model, we learn things. The aim can be to generate knowledge, the aim can be to create something, but you always do both things at the same time. And uh, the creative tension that happens here within the model can all, uh, uh, between the model and reality also happens within the modeling process. And that's the point, one of the points of using computational tools in modeling. Because we have concepts and we create an implementation based on the concepts. And that implementation could be through writing software, it could be making a 3D model, it could be just 
data entry, I mean, it can be any kind of methodology. And the point is, we can see the whole thing here as a model based experiment, where the whole thing is part of the model. And then this process of going from concept to implementation is doing. And uh, the other process is learning. So, ever heard about learning by doing? This is learning by doing. So, we have attention and it's highly creative. It can make us learn things and understand things. So, if again we take this example, this was how it was found in 1904. Um, and uh, this is an abstract model of something no human has ever seen. Because it's impossible to see a mound this way. So this is a reconstruction. It's a model based on the technology they had at the time, which was they had a bunch of professional drawers connected to the archaeological <coughs> group doing the work. Uh, today we see more things like this, uh, a 3D scan of same Viking ship, but also this. This is an illustration from a stress model created by a shipping certification company because there were discussions about moving this thing and also whether the way it was mounted would lead to breakdown over the next years. And the stress model is basically an engineering model based on analysis of samples from the ship and other remains connected to it, uh, uh, other experiences found in literature and ordinary engineering calculations as, as engineers do it, uh, working on this material stuff and of course with the uncertainty expressed as clearly as possible, possible. And it's a lot of uncertainty of course. And the point is they could then predict the time before breakdown of the structure depending on whether it was uh, located at the same place where it was moved and whether you had catastrophe impact on it and st stuff like that. So it is a nice report with the mathematics, again, fake mathematics. Um, and the point is, this is a prediction of the future. But it's not a prediction of the future in order to predict the future. The point of this report is just is not to say, this ship, if you do nothing, it will break down in 30 years. Then you wait, and after 28 years, the ship breaks down and say, yeah, that's fairly good. Only two years off. That's good. Now, the point is to know that this is a reasonable time frame in which you have to do something to avoid breakdown. So in that sense, it's like a climate model or a conflict model. It's a model in order to change the future and to avoid what you predict from happening. So um, I will basically just skip through this. Uh, it's uh, modeling in uh, theater, creating 3D models as part of the study programs we do in Cologne, advanced bachelor students. Uh, so a visual model of the theater play and the sort of an arithological structure. So you see it's, it's a little bit of branching and game-like appearance. And the idea is to fuse theory, modeling with implementation. So you develop your models based on the implementations. You do also the theory and the understanding and you implement based on these things. So it's practice-based theory and theory-based practice. Um, and with modeling playing a fundamental role. We have currently four or 500 students, two study programs, bachelor and master level. Uh, humanities candidates, they can pr they know how to program. So they learn C++ or Java in the, in the second year. Uh, and then of course they use all sorts of languages in projects later. So, um, but they also have their other parts of their study programs, which is either media studies, with media computer science as part of it or any other in the other study programs. And that means that they have also a lot of humanities theory. They have a bit of computer science basics. I mean, you need to know logic and a few other things, but just what you need in order to be programmers. So it's just what you need to do the practice. The theory comes from the humanities. So our model is not the interlinking uh, programmers and people from the humanities, but these two sets of competences within the same candidate. And it's a specific way of doing it. It's the way I have been working all my life. Some people do it. It's useful for some types of work. So 
of course, all university teaching is supposed to be research-based, right? And often it is, one way or the other. Um, but in our case, it's also practice-based, which is something I know very, I really know from my uh, training in computer science uh, 10,000 years ago. We learned Simula. Look it up. It's a programming language. It was a programming language. Um, and uh, the problem, one of the problems we are facing in this, I mean, practice-based teaching is fine. We teach things by letting people do it. They run their projects. At master level, they, they design the projects. They choose what to do. They implement, they document, they write essays about it. They just run the whole process. Um, use, often use some sort of modified uh, agile scrum methodology, which works for, we even trying, some students are even trying to develop uh, a Scrum similar methodology that actually works for student projects because Scrum as such cannot be applied to student projects for some very specific reasons. Um, the problem is, of course, what theory? Because there's no theory in the humanities. Well, there's a lot of theory in the humanities, but there's no coherent theory. Uh, archaeology, uh, literary studies, and history surely don't have the same concept of theory. Historians don't have a concept of theory. Archaeologists think they're scientific. And literary scholars think they can do everything, and at least they're better philosophers than the philosophers. So their theory is just right, because they understand humans, whereas the others only understand other things. So it's, it's, we're we having students coming in with very different theoretical backgrounds. So that means we have to, in a way, when they're doing theory-practice connection, it's, of course, very often specifically connected to what they do, but often we have to, in a way, be open for n a number of different theoretical approaches to what they do. To be fair, they often do projects also connected to their other studies. So a historian often would be somewhat interested in history because that's what they study in addition to our stuff. So a model is a way to make the abstract concrete and also to manipulate this concrete thing we have created. And manipulation, creation is a way of manipulating, of course. This is really useful when the meaning and the tools are understood by the same person. But of course, it also works in this kind of computer scientist humanist collaboration, or indeed um, um, how somebody wants to buy a house architect combination, all these sorts of architects. I want a bookshelf. I don't know how to make bookshelves. You are a carpenter. You know how to make bookshelves, and we communicate. Of course, this works all the time. So I'm, I'm not saying this is the only way of doing it, but it's an in interesting one to explore. Some people need to understand both, at least. And of course, all our students are not good programmers. And the basis module for programming, we have the grading is based on levels. So a lot of students aim for the worst grade because they just want to get through it. But some aim for and get the best grade because they're interested. And what you see in projects later, some people are doing the most part of the programming. Some people are doing things connected to it. Point is, everybody knows programming by having done it, even if they're not really good. This is about practical work. And our traditional university level pedagogical principles are only partially able to give us an understanding of what's happening. So we need also to understand traditional guild-based, practical, discipline-based uh, teaching and learning in order to understand this. And my personal background for this is that my father was a forestry school teachers, teacher. So I could still chop down a tree with a train go, uh, train, okay. chainsaw and uh, might even manage to do simple things on a tractor motor. Uh, it doesn't really matter what kind of a theory, practice, understanding, but it's, it, it's important to tap into this tradition, how you embody, embody practical activities. Because to me, programming is partly embodied as an activity. The intuition you get becoming a good programmer, feeling where to look for bugs. Because, I mean, programming is not about writing code. I mean, how much code writing do we? Maximum 20%. Rest of the time is debugging and organizing and reading through other people's code and try to reuse it. Come on. So, so this whole debugging process, this whole process of trying to understand the structures, 
is complex, but it's also very practical. And yeah, whether you call it embodied or not, this is just a feeling and not really scholarly. So to us, digital and humanities is also practice and theory, and also operationalization and abstraction. And they have to be connected. Of course, very open for questions, but I have to put this. For us, digital humanities is not computer science plus humanities. It doesn't mean that it's never computer science plus humanities. It's just that this is the model we're running. And this is the model I've basically been running all of my life. And uh, it's one way of doing this. I have to add these people. These are some people I work with in a Volkswagen-funded Volkswagen Foundation, not the car company, funded project on, on modeling. Uh, there is a lot of student input. My predecessor in, uh, in, uh, in Cologne is highly influential uh, because he basically, together with another professor, created this whole way of doing teaching and a lot of other colleagues. And uh, did I mention Mantretala? And uh, then, of course, it's all the question askers. I, um, I mean, this is serious. It's not just something I say. I'm not really that worried about answers because you can always find answers. And uh, the process of finding answers once you have a good question is straightforward. In humanities, often there are no answers, but at least you can work towards answers because this is one of the real differences between our discipline if we see the humanities as a discipline, which we cannot. Computer science is about problem solving. There's a lot more to computer science, but I trust Mar. Ask me or look it up if you wonder who this German Mar is, but he is a retired computer scientist in, in Germany. There is always an implementation somewhere in the future in a computer science project and uh, in computer science research. It doesn't have to be nearby, but there's always this basic thinking that this will or can at some level lead to something being implemented. And that implementation will solve a problem or a number of problems. In the humanities, we have been struggling with the same problems we're still struggling with for at least two and a half thousand years. That's a documented written history. Problems of representation, of semiotics, of understanding what art is, uh, the, the, the difference between poetic truth and historical truth, why a poem can tell you something more important than a history book or not. All these things we have been struggling with for a long time and we know we're not going to find answers in the sense of definite answers because they don't exist and they will never exist. What we do is rediscussing things. We solve a number of practical questions along the way, of course. Some questions are solved and hooked out and, and done with, but a lot of these core questions will never be solved. So what we are doing now is to use the computer and the fact that we can play with these tools to find new ways of discussing the same things. New ways of understanding theater, which is also a very old art form. By creating virtual reality versions of theater, we say something about theater that nobody could say 100 years ago. On the other hand, some of the things we are saying is not that different from what Brecht said long before virtual reality and a lot of other people. So we're interacting with that. That's one part of what we're doing. The other part is trying to understand what is happening in the digital world based on the fact that we have some thinking in the humanities. That's less of my personal interest, but uh, people in the humanities has a lot of things to say about uh, uh, how Facebook is developing the development of, of, of the democracy. Obviously, social scientists have a lot to say too, but I mean, Whenever you have a political problem, just ask somebody from, uh, from classics and they will tell you how this was exactly the same in Roman times or in Greek times at some point. And uh, how the Persian and the Greek model is representing that, 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 and did it today and they solve the problem for you. Right? Thank you. No? Yes? Cesar, <laughs> please. I have like a million questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I have like a million questions about modeling, but I, I want to focus on one thing. You, you mentioned um, at several points in your presentation this issue about uh, 
whether humanists should also be programmers or not, and your model, and I'm curious about your personal views. So, although you said that there is no final answer to this, what are, in your views, the pros and cons of teaching humanists to become programmers or teaching software engineers to become a, bit of a little bit of, of a humanist as well? I think um, in computational linguistics, you often see uh, reasonably well-functioning computer science departments doing computational linguistics. I have not seen many examples from other humanities disciplines. So this is just em empirical soft evidence, so just observation. Um, one of the problems in Central and Western Europe, and I think in North America, and probably in some other parts of the world, with people from the humanities when it comes to programming is the lack of mathematical knowledge, which means that our students can easily create 3D models, virtual reality systems, and computer games, but they cannot work on light rendering in, in VR systems because they have no clue about the math. I mean, seriously, this is... I would really have to reread textbooks from 30 years back and work a lot before I even get up to understand what's going on. And it's the same with audio. Understanding what is happening in, in audio. We have specific people who can do it, but that's just because they happen to know mathematics from before. Uh, but uh, in audio, you have to operate with the imaginary numbers. That is, not, that is not even basic university mathematics. That's fairly advanced. So uh, that is different in Russia obviously, where uh, mathematics is the mother of the disciplines. So in Moscow State University, there is a faculty of history with, an, um, in with a department for archaeology, which is fun. Uh, but they also have a de department for digital history and mathematical modeling. And this is partly based on the fact that also humanities candidates know mathematics at a much higher level than in the West. But also, of course, goes back to Russian and, and Soviet views on history where formal modeling uh, was for obvious reasons, much more, much more common. So I think uh, the first thing is that it's really contextual. And uh, one of the things you need, if you are creating a digital humanities study program, what many people do is to create that master level. And if it's created at master level in the humanities faculty for humanities candidates, forget programming. Even with a two years master, the last half year is for the master thesis, so you have one and a half years. And you cannot teach somebody to program and then apply it in one and a half years. It doesn't work that way. If not if you're going to do other things as well in parallel. So uh, for only a master program, you can develop good tool users. We have a certificate, which is a con basic IP for everybody in the humanities and elsewhere. And that is about being a good tool user. And being able to understand your tools as a user is important. But both for political and practical reasons, understanding it by recreating it is a different level. Um, so we have a full five-year study program with bachelor and master, which means that we only accept master students for one of the study programs have a lot of computational linguistics. So in order to start a master, they need to know linguistics, documented, and uh, an object-oriented programming language. Uh, and why we use object orientation is basically because it's a long tradition in the fields we're working. And object orientation is a type of encapsulation and organization of larger computer systems. So object oriented is not the point, but it's one of the ways of doing it. And finally, we're doing quite a lot of object oriented modeling. And it's not the same, but if you know how object orientation works as a programmer, it's easier to understand how it works in modeling. Anyway, so uh, and in the other, uh, me the media base, you have to document knowledge university level knowledge in the humanities and again object oriented programming which means that the majority of our candidates are internal but having 400 bachelor students and only 50 60 70 master students we basically have enough to fill up the programs and then uh, we have people coming from the outside either they just take half a year and learn some things for instance programming if that's what they're lacking or if they are really motivated and they have some additional, we sometimes allow them in, but they have to do some bachelor courses as part. So, so we are fairly flexible because master students are only, we're only accepting like 20 master students every year. So we can be a bit, uh, bit flexible on individual basis. So um, I think 
it also operates in a very specific context. It operates in a context where there's no computer science at the university, which is pretty weird for a 50,000 student university, one of the two largest in Germany. Uh, it will come, but traditionally it hasn't been. So some people have been following our study programs in order to become computer scientists, more or less. Uh, applied computer science, it would then be. Because there is uh, business computer science and bio computer science and so on. There's a computer science department but they don't have a clean computer science study program. That has also opened up a bit. And also Cologne is the media capital of Germany. That's where most of the media industry and a lot of uh, games industry at the level of not creating engines, but creating the actual games based on the engines live. So we can easily feed uh, tens of uh, bachelor candidates into the system every year. They just swallow it. It's, it's they are jobs. And that means that we have uh, at least five times more applications than we have candidates for media computer science because people are interested and there are jobs. Then we have 30% drop off in the second year because that's when they realize they actually have to program. <laughs> uh, but 30% drop off, drop off at, at bachelor level is normal in Germany and many of the students just change to another study program uh, or they go into practical education, which is also strong in Germany. Also in Cologne, we have a games lab, which is part of the Technische Hochschule. So it's the polytechnics are still separated from the humanities, giving a more practical education. And there is a fairly successful games lab with uh, quite a few employees. And they are doing practical education in games development. Uh, they do rendering. Uh, they have also a more engineering approach to what they do. So, so I think I think uh, we cannot say take this model and move it here. Uh, we have to look at the context we're operating in, the size of the city, the the job market, uh, the kind of interest students have, and the history behind this. And uh, and for me, it's fairly easy. If somebody wants to do a digital humanities, digital cultural heritage education without programming, there are a number of places they can go. Uh, so the point is, we also need diversity. And I think uh, what we are li looking into also in Cologne is, it's not me, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's also a professor in archaeoinformatics, archaeological computer science there, Eleftheria Palio. And uh, so at that department, they're creating a master in digital archaeology. And that is also a master made for archaeologists. So that means that it will be tool used but not programming unless they really want to do it and they can pay for it for that, unless they already know it. But they can, you cannot expect it. Uh, in Oslo, there was some sort of digital humanities study programs most of the 1990s. I actually have a master from that myself. Uh, called S Language, Literature and Information. It had a f one focus on formal logic and one focus on computational linguistics and did some other things. That was... Um, uh, when the humanities faculty really implemented the Bologna process and created these more strict study programs, uh, because Oslo was totally flexible before. My, my, my bachelor thesis is computer science, mathematics, and uh, general literature, which is quite normal. And then they just looked at the credits, and then they sent a diploma from, uh, from the Realfag, from the technical uh, faculty, because there were like 10 more credit points on that side. And if it had been balanced, then they would have made an inter interfaculty thing. So, it, so before Bologna, it was totally flexible. But then you got these very organized study programs and so on. And, uh, and um, it meant that it was hard to get this digital humanities functioning in the humanities. Because what happened was that nobody was really interested in the 90s. But they took one or two courses just to get a little bit. And then they got triggered and moved over and took bachelor and master uh, degrees in, in that program and some PhDs too. And when that system fell, it was moved to computer science. And uh, what is remaining from it is computational linguistics. The rest is gone. Uh, of course, people still do formal logic, but not connected to the humanities in, in that sense. And again, strongly connected to, to linguistics. I mean, there are a few other examples. There are also study programs in something like this from computer science, which works. So, so I don't have I don't have any strong opinions, but as partly a computer scientist myself, 
I think that for a majority of people, the general, the fundamental mindset from the cultures I know well is fundamentally different. Uh, it's often easier to communicate with another literary scholar in India than to com communicate with a computer scientist at the same same university, and it's the same from the other disciplines. And um, and uh, looking into this modeling thing, one of the things that really surprised me a little bit is that in many ways, in many of these soft concepts I have used about modeling, we're actually closer to natural science. We, we in, in the humanities, we're closer to physics than we are to techno sciences in how we think about modeling and how we see modeling. Because it's more about this epistemological learning part of modeling than the real instrumental things. Because in physics, you don't make anything. You do, but that's just to understand physics. And so the whole, uh, the accelerators and everything, nobody wants an accelerator. They want to understand physics, and therefore you need an accelerator, right? So again, it's, it's, it's not engineering. And I think just to finish off this, I don't know, even know if it's an answer. <laughs> engineering science and computer science are contradictions by term. And computer science was explicitly created as a contradiction by term in the late 60s because people saw it as a possibility for funding. It was exactly the same reason why digital humanities was created as a semantically empty concept uh, around the mid, around 2004, 2005, to attract funding and to grow the field to cover other areas. So this is a common reason for, uh, for establishing disciplines in the 20th, 21st century, and it's perfectly fine. And remember, English departments in US universities, which is now seen as one of the most fundamental and established things, that's where you study literature and language in US universities, that discipline was created in the late 19th century. It's really new. And in the 17th century, natural sciences were called natural philosophy and were part of the humanities. So in the 17th century, people in the humanities, philosophers, did experiments. They did disgusting experiments on animals. They were doing all sorts. I mean, Newton was first and foremost uh, in theology. And then he also did physics. And physics was part of natural philosophy. So when natural philosophy left the, uh, the humanities, that's when humanities regained this strong, strong focus on the written that it also had previously. And there were always these disciplines like archaeology, ethnography, art history, where, where you had material culture understanding, also paleography, a number of others. But what the digital humanities might do is also rebuild a bit of the experimental part of what we do, just to make things more fun, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions for Evgeny? No, I, I have a lot of them, but uh, it's, you know, maybe we are, we can finish here and, yeah. Okay. So thank you all for being here and uh, Avin is here uh, also tomorrow. So if you are interested in talking with us about whatever, we are here. Okay, so thank you.